What is up, Zain Men and Memon? My apologies. Uh, I'm glad to uh, have you on my podcast. Welcome to the Vinamrit Kasana Show. I'm also glad to see that both of us have had uh, recent haircuts. Not exactly bald, but almost there. The, the clips that I've seen of you have a very vibrant mm-hmm. hairstyle. So, so what's up with that? Is that to combat the heat? Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah just to combat the heat and uh just to be just just to be neat and not uh, worry about combing my hair every day yeah <laughs> i'm so glad yeah. to be talking to you finally i've been following your podcast and it's great to talk to you finally thank you man likewise this has been in the making for a while uh because of the mm-hmm. fucking cyclone in mumbai and and elsewhere in western <laughs> india we couldn't do it uh, yeah mm-hmm. but uh i'm glad to have you on here the first thing that i want to sort of address is because mm-hmm. you know it, it's weird people still don't mind other people's whatsapp statuses to see who they are right but your dreams <laughs> stupid people shouldn't breathe yeah right? and it, mm-hmm. it's that yeah. sort of polarizing about that. statement yeah yeah is that in jest or are you actually you know believe that talk to me about that so it's i put it up when i first got whatsapp in 2010 or yeah. something when the status first happened uh it's yeah. partly in jest uh it's a very loaded statement to make and i and i don't for a second stand for uh eugenics of any kind so let's let's, let's get out that out of, out of the way <laughs> yeah who's who's the thinker who who, who st- uh, talks about that charles murray that's his name right I don't know. There have been tons of thinkers about different kinds of eugenics, and I don't subscribe yeah. to any of them, or any of the po- any of the popular, problematic ones. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just in jest. It's also, uh, it's just uh, I put it up in a time when I was a little angsty, younger yeah. Yeah. self, where I just hated on uh, people not. <laughs> uh, making the wisest uh, wisest choices and uh, i think that reflects in the politicians they have elected yeah man that 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 is a loaded state to state for itself <laughs> <laughs> um you know you know what's fascinating about about that is it, it it does it does show um a very clear like the idea of breeding itself is is you know a biological statement right like you're not saying mm-hmm. super people should 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 die or super super people should read more books you're saying super people should not breed right and and so uh, what i want to sort of get at first of all is mm-hmm. this idea of games right uh, based mm-hmm. on the research that i was doing on you i bought two board games for myself and my family to see to mm-hmm. see how our own you know family dynamics play out in board games see who cheats mm-hmm. in that which way. ones it, you know i live in faridabad here so it's like i i got <laughs> shitty games because the only toy shop that was open had like business mm-hmm. which is the counterfeit version of monopoly and mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> um i had the classic chess so so it was uh-huh. interesting to see that but talk so to me talk different to me. end of yeah. spectrum entirely uh uh so interestingly now they're talking about business and uh, monopoly was built i think 34 as a yeah. criticism for modern day crony capitalism but i think somewhere along the line that we lost the plot on that messaging uh, uh games have have been very fascinating to me because uh my inquiry has always been in how do we how do we learn better how do we uh, upgrade ourselves uh, regularly and that uh, inquiry has led me down multiple paths from behavioral economics to uh, to evolutionary biology to uh, to to mainstream media mm-hmm. uh, it always fascinated me to wonder why we played games and uh, to answer that question it is very important to understand that when we say why do we play games the we is not just the human species but uh most higher order animals uh if you notice cubs kittens lions they all play games and why why are so many species playing um it's very rare that a species or multiple species do something that does not have any evolutionary benefit to them hmm. uh so if not now at some point playing must have had a uh, evolutionary of basis to be naturally selected and that basis was this the modern world or sorry not the modern world world life in general is is very very high stakes yeah uh a single misstep could mean losing out on the hunt and going hungry or worse being hunted mm-hmm. in such an eventuality how do you train for the moment of hunt 
uh, you train by lowering the stakes of the hunt by hunting in jest and that's what most primitive games were uh, the games you see your cats and dogs play the games we play as children are uh, a tag a hide and seek uh, are throwing stones we are preparing for uh, we are preparing for the eventuality of hunting or gathering mm -hmm. uh, but you know we invented civilization of 100000 years ago and life hasn't been the same for for, for humans uh, we don't normally find ourselves being hunted or hunting we as a matter of fact find ourselves in very very complex economic systems and complex uh, social systems and uh, we still play the old, our old games so the question was this how do we use the biological uh, response and uh, uh, reward systems of playing and uh, and divert them towards learning about our modern world because any child who who wants to play and not study on a fundamental biological level wants to learn mm -hmm. so the desire to learn and desire to be able be more equipped to deal with the world around you is very very innately biological it's just that we want to learn the wrong thing so mm -hmm. given the modern world uh, how do you build games that build on the same building blocks of prehistoric games but equip equip as for everything from writing finding the right partner to handle to dealing with modern day capitalism to dealing with uh, uh, injustices that are happening in society on a daily basis that all of us have to navigate so that's something that i've been actively working in for the last few years uh, i've been building games around uh, the modern world we find ourselves in one of them has already uh, lo uh, launched there are two more in the pipeline yeah so I see. Yeah, man. Uh, there's a lot of things that you just said there. Uh, in fact, when mm -hmm. I was coming to record my podcast right here with mm -hmm. you, I, I was mm -hmm. uh, I was outside the gate and I saw for the first mm -hmm. time this, uh, these mm -hmm. kids. You know what a pukata mm -hmm. is? A pukata is where you essentially um, all of the kids sort of join their hands in together and they all just you know make them fly like mm -hmm. this up in the air. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. With their respective uh, sure, sides, yeah, yeah. that sort of thing, right? Uh -huh. And and because I could only. I was like, you know, fumbling with keys and my bag and all that, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I could only mm -hmm. hear and like see from my peripheries what game they were playing. But it was apparently mm -hmm. a game of uh, some something along the lines of, you know, those games where um, you give the person who tags people one category. So he'll say something like cars, right? And then you've named yourself, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Someone is Ferrari, mm -hmm. right? And then you can mm -hmm. suddenly call whatever the 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 person who's denning. I don't know the better word for that, mm -hmm. right? Or who's attacking? Yeah, you and I don't. Yeah, <laughs> when, whenever, whenever they're uh, doing their den, mm -hmm. right, and and you are in th in threat, right, you're threatened by him. You can mm -hmm. immediately say someone else's name, right. So if you're Ferrari mm -hmm. and, and the denner comes close to you, you can say Porsche, right. And so I was fascinated by that because mm -hmm. for the longest time, um, in, since the last six or seven years, I haven't mm -hmm. seen those games as frequently as I used to back when I was a kid. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. led me to believe that you know th there is something very. Uh, primal about games that that we just miss mm -hmm. out on and and in, mm -hmm. instead i think what happens is and again this is my conjecture i do not have the same table and speciality in games as you but i believe that instead mm -hmm. what, be, what happens is we we play more in virtual games where where the rules mm -hmm. are all messed up and th there isn't exactly a clear directed path w w what do you think about like what do you think about that like uh, our our you know innate uh, our innate biology to play games in the, in the physical mm -hmm. world and then the games we play online mm -hmm. um so to answer the question i have to make a few uh i have Please to do. establish a few things before mm -hmm. the first thing is that uh, uh when we perceive things as you uh, as humans or other higher order species we don't necessarily uh input all the information in front of us what we look for is markers of information interesting a silhouette of a man is enough to tell you that it's a man mm -hmm. Uh, the scent of a flower is enough to tell you that there is possibly a flower nearby. Uh, the sound of a waterfall, uh, 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 the sound of water flowing, uh, can tell you there's water nearby, and you don't have to see the water. So right. symbols, uh, symbols, and uh, markers become placeholders for entire phenomena. What this helps us do is be, uh, is gives us the ability to parse more and more information. Um, a monkey climbing down from a tree in forest and savanna environment spots a dot in the grass. Hmm. On closer inspection, sees multiple dots. 
Mm-hmm. And as he, as the monkey as it keeps watching, it realizes that all these dots are moving in tandem. It takes this information and runs it through its a repository of genetic and uh, memetic information, and realizes, hey, these moving dots are the are the the fur coat of a leopard, and climbing down right now might just be uh, detrimental. It didn't have to see the leopard. All it had to see was markers for the leopard. Interesting. Uh, similarly, we use we look for markers even in nutrition. Uh, something that uh, that makes us. Uh, a smell, a smell of rotten eggs that makes us repels is, is our body's way of saying it. Do not ingest this. Do not go near it. It's going to be bad for your health. Yeah. Uh, uh, while the, skunks the will happiness, attack their attackers, right? Like they'll attack yeah, their attackers or, with this horrible, horrible smell. Yeah, they are, they, that's, we'll get into that a little later on okay. uh, adaptive and exaptive uh, uh, usages. Um, similarly, uh, sorry, Ahmed, I didn't thought. Yeah. Uh, similarly, when we consume sugar, we feel good. Uh, why do we feel good? Because we enjoy it, and that's a tautological statement. Why do we enjoy sugar? We enjoy sugar because sugar is carbohydrates. Ingesting sugar allows us to run, allows us to run for longer, allows us mm-hmm. to have more energy to gather more, to hunt more. And sugar in uh, the environments we evolved in was rare. Naturally growing fruits were rare to find, and once you find find them. Our body, through natural selection, through natural selection, incentivized ingesting those carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, because our code is never accounted for the eventuality that we will find too much sugar ever, there is no upper limit uh, to how much sugar we can find, right. uh, to how much sugar we enjoy. Now, what that leads to is a phenomenon that, that Dr. V. S. Ramachandran. Uh, 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 terms as the peak shift principle hmm. if x amount of something is good 10x is better now that works in the food we eat that all works in the markers we look for in our partners and our kin right muscles are good to hunt more muscles are better uh if you look at the sculpture of i'm just one second just referencing something give me a second a uh, Venus of what's the full name? The Venus of Willendorf. If you look at this ten thousand year old sculpture, you will see that the 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 female anatomy has been exaggerated uh, immensely because just like uh, just like our food, the peak shift principle also applies to uh, visual cues. That explains and that is exactly, anatomy as well. That explains a lot of modern pop culture. That explains war movies. That explains WWE. That explains uh, romances. That explains uh, criminal dramas. That explains pornography. That explains mm-hmm. PUBG. Mm. Uh, the peak shift principle uh, is taking lots of stimulus and giving it to the user in one go. Yeah. And creating peaks of dopamine, serotonin, and cortisol, and adrenaline. Uh, it's like it's it's a dopamine rush, not exactly like a, like a line of cocaine, but somewhere there. Yeah, it's 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 small and pinchy enough that you want to keep doing it. It's the same idea that uh, it's 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 very very cheap and inexpensive dopamine, particularly seen when you know you you're micro transactions and like micro rewards. Yeah, you're you're almost like mining for it, like on and and suddenly when you have it, you're like ah, oh, and then and then mm. then you go through a cycle again. But that's that's more yeah. about the sort of so what you're basically saying is that we had these peaks, these natural peaks, and then we 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 thought we have natural markers that we look for, and we yeah. condense those markers uh, yeah. into into shorter, quicker, more uh, more condensed bursts of information that create spikes in our response systems. Yeah. So then, in that case, talk to me about the way you mm-hmm. consume information. Talk to me about the way uh, you um, are able to synthesize information and inputs without getting overloaded. Mm-hmm. Because what 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 seems uh, to me from all of this is that mm-hmm. you seem to have a sense of clarity um, when it mm-hmm. comes to how these systems have been hacked, and and there's mm-hmm. almost like you almost like have an edge. So do enlighten us. Mm-hmm. What is the edge? So while I do on a on while I do fundamentally know the the in the engineering at play over that doesn't necessarily mean that i'm immune to it 
I had a red bit before this conversation. I'm going to have desserts after dinner, and I'm yeah. going to go online and play some violent video games at night. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but having said that, uh, it's as a as a creator of content, as a creator of culture, I think it is an imperative uh, responsibility to to steer where conversations are going, uh, mm. because whether we like it or not, natural selection for all its in its classical sense for all its effects and purposes is over. We're never going to. Uh, uh change the thickness of our skin or uh the uh or our or improve or or reduce our eyesight capabilities because we don't need to uh we have evolved we we have through through culture evolved ways of manipulating the environment around us um in the short term that this allows natural selection to take place in the long term Hmm. So we don't go through generation of, generations of natural selection anymore because if it's too hot, we turn the fan on. If it's too cold, we uh, put on a blanket. Right. Um, so, so but just how we do evolve? Way, what exactly is the concept of natural selection for everyone who's listening right now? Uh, natural selection, to uh, to put it very very crude, crudely, is uh, now how do I do this without sounding reductive? Um, ah, I see. So you do place parameters <laughs> on your thinking. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, um, is is uh, is as Darwin put it. Should I just quote him? Yeah, please. Should I just not make a misquote? See, that's very interesting. It's so refreshing to see Indian intellectuals mm-hmm. and thinkers uh, not blatantly say statements and then and then you know uh, not take take away the responsibility that, that goes along with explaining that when someone, some viewer slash listener says, Hey, what did you mean by that? I, you know, I'm always committing suicide. Please let me know. And you're like, Oh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm going to paraphrase from Wikipedia. Uh, so Please. let's say, or I'm going to give you a, actually I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Now imagine there are two frogs, right? Uh, both of them are green in color. Uh-huh. Um, and both of them have 10 offsprings right. each. One of them has no variation, has no mutation in its, uh, uh, in, in reproduction. So all 10 offsprings are the exact same green color, the exact same traits and exact same genetic code. Yep. On the other hand, the other frog has a major mutation that does not regulate color while reproduction. Now this I'm talking in complete soft science, and this is not how frogs reproduce. Uh, okay. But uh, but for the sake of an example, I, yeah. For the just a, uh, a simple example to give. Uh, mm. Now this frog has ten different uh, the offspring that of ten different colors, ranging all the way from bright red to brown to blue. Okay, these frogs frogs generally live in a pond, which is where the floor is covered in algae. I see. So the green frogs are naturally camouflaged, but one fine day there's a, a small landslide and the pond gets flooded with mud. Now all the frogs are shining bright in the green sea, in, 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 oh, on the brown, the green is shining bright on the brown, making them easy pickings for the birds and ducks around. Right. But one of the offsprings of the, of the frog that had a mutation was brown and naturally camouflaged. It wasn't smarter, it wasn't faster, it didn't do anything intentionally. Hmm. It just happened to be the fittest. Survival of the fittest does not mean the strongest or the fastest or the uh, most adapt. Uh, It just basically means what fits best in the environment. Right, at that given. So through, during that lifespan. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Through trial and error, through again, there's no agency involved. Of course, it's all yeah. it's all purely mechanical. Through trial and error, through generation and generations of weeding, uh, weeding out, uh, life picks certain traits that allow it to uh, that allow it to uh, permeate and spread faster over traits that don't. Mm-hmm. This selection of traits uh, through evolution through uh, through mutation in reproduction is natural selection. I see. And okay. natural selection, uh, depending on the lifespan and uh, and the reproduction cycle of an organism, 
can take anywhere from a few weeks for some organisms to hundreds of years for more complex life forms like humans. Now, dialing back to what I was saying earlier, because we are so good at changing our environment, classical natural selection has stopped. But what has happened is on this genetic layer that we call the human genome, the, hum the, the homo sapiens species, yeah. lies a, a, a thin, beautiful layer of memes. Now, when I say memes, I don't need, mean in internet memes you find on 9gag and 4chan. Yeah. Is, is, are but like I, memes one step removed from archetypes, that sort of thing? Uh, so memes were coined in, I think, 1978 by Dawkins in his seminal book, uh, The Shellfish Gene. Yeah. Uh, he talks about the smallest unit of culture. He talks about uh, uh, the nod that you, the nod or the hmm sound that you make when I say something and you agree with it or you acknowledge it, to greeting each other when we start the call, to uh, just listening. Uh, all come are all memes that come together to form the memeplex of uh, of good listening. Good listening and other memeplexes come together to form culture. So non biological data that cannot be passed through pure reproduction is memetic information. Are memes? And these are these are things that we we mime from each other, or these are things that are contained within us within our own biologies. Like okay. they are not contained in the biology. Interesting. Memories, yes, not our biology. So again, our lived memories, yes, not our genetic memories. Yeah, because because like, uh, Carl Jung has this idea of archetypes, right? And that that's that's mm -hmm. a more uh, that's a more ex extrapolatory idea. It doesn't have by the same biological underpinnings that that, that mm -hmm. a meme might have, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, we'll get into Jung and uh, and um, uh, and continent philosophers a little later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just completing this thought. Now on this layer of genetic. Uh, material, uh, the, the, the GTCA of our genome lies a layer of memetic material. Uh, these are things that we learn with our lifespan, things that we cannot pass on biologically. Uh, these, this is the core reason that humans have been able to uh, have been able to uh, 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 be, reproduce and evolve and capture so much, so many resources and be so successful as life forms in the past 10,000 years. Uh, this layer of memes that allows us to pass on information from generation to generation so that you and I don't have to reinvent the meme, uh, the wheel. You and I don't have, uh, can stand on the shoulders of giants who are themselves standing on shoulders of giants yeah. uh, for 10,000 years uh, in, and having everything from the internet to, uh, to language to being able to talk to each other at distances that was never possible are, is, the, is the mimetic advantage we have. Now, given that that is the core fundamental principle that gives our, our species an edge, that allows us to have democracy, equality, rights, which are all alien concepts in the natural world. The natural world is replete with rape and coercion and murder. Uh, I think it is... I think it is a fundamental responsibility and, and an imperative responsibility for culture creators to be very, very careful about uh, what they are saying and how they are saying it. I am just an actor, I am just a filmmaker and uh, I don't think that uh, what I say changes the, how the world works or sets some bad example are very, very callous and uh, irresponsible statements that a lot of people make. Yeah, it's a, it's the same sort of criticism that Steve Jobs had of consultants. It's like if you're a consultant, take responsibility mm -hmm. for your advice, right? Yeah, uh, and uh, I think uh, Nicholas Talib talks uh, a lot about this in his book Skin in the Game. Love that. That book. if yeah. you don't have skin in the game, uh, you're not going to take uh, take decisions that are going to be well informed, and then uh, then talks takes the convention forward into the convention of decentralized democracies where it's important for people to make decisions on a local level as opposed mm. to uh, uh, delegating it to someone who has no idea of ground reality who doesn't have skin in the game yeah uh, but i think as a creator it's my responsibility to be very careful on what i put out if i put out more films or media or games where people are just landing headshots or uh, not treating minorities uh, well, uh, that is how the species will evolve. Well, those are the uh, conversations that will, uh, that will travel. 
and we have a genetic predisposition to uh, be attracted to violence and sex mm. because it causes a very uh, primitive peak shift uh, so it is very important for filmmakers for game creators for any kind of uh, any kind of knowledge creators. worker in the 21st century any anyone who's using his brain to communicate something. anyone who's putting out anyone who's putting ideas out there to be very careful of what ideas they're putting out there yeah mm-hmm. well, that is exactly what separates us from the uh, from every, from every other species that's ever lived on this planet right right so talk to me about this idea so uh, there's obviously mm-hmm. this idea of uh, you know uh, most cultures have a very innate mm-hmm. sense of you know oral storytelling right so so you learn mm-hmm. about the myths that your ancestors lived through mm-hmm. and then you learn mm-hmm. about the myths that your parents ancestors lived through and so on mm-hmm. and, and so the process begins right so so for example mm-hmm. i would say you know i'm the descendant of alexander one and he did this these glorious things or our culture mm-hmm. is especially made for war mm-hmm. that sort of thing right uh, mm-hmm. but but that, but that is storytelling at its core right and and it's up for your interpretation mm-hmm. is there like a synonym between stories and memes story is nothing but a series of memes put together uh, the idea they are, they are they are non again they are non genetic data points that we are communicating each other which is the fundamental definition of a story uh, as a matter of fact this is the exact basis on which we named our studio hmm. uh, the studio I, yeah it's called memesis it's again uh, it's uh, it's short for memetic systems because we are storytellers we understand that we create and craft and engineer memetic systems and hence memesis hmm. so so in that sense what could let's just say creators who put out a lot of disjuncted fragmented content around what could they uh, sort of do better to um, use our natural uh, ability to you know put mm-hmm. together a bunch of memes and and make sense what could they do better right uh so this is something i have been talking uh, that i completely believe in that for a storyteller for a content creator the last thing that they need to learn is how to create the content because that is something that you can hire hire someone for if you really want to tell stories if you really want to put ideas out there you need to learn everything from economics to politics to gender rights uh, to minority rights to uh, to how the stock market works to uh, evolutionary biology because knowing how to work a camera or a mic is great but once you ha- know how to do that what is the story that you're going to tell what is that chapter you're going to add to this to the book of human civilization and is that chapter worth adding hmm. i don't want another uh another action movie i don't want another rambo right we have had a million of those uh in, in rambo 2 he fought he fought the russians uh with the help of the taliban in the next one if it will get made he won't fight the taliban with the help of the russians i don't know what's happening uh and it's just the same story again and again and again and doesn't add to civilization as a matter of fact it sets sends out a very strong notion action movies classically have been this a scientist does something and fucks up can i say that yeah. is it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. please yeah. say yeah. all the okay. all all, all uh, the yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah uh a scientist uh does something and fucks up and then this tall hunking brooding rude angry gi joe comes in and saves the day but yeah. that's not how the world works uh politic bad policy makers bad leaders uh gi joes go out and fuck the world up and it is the scientists who come in and save the day yeah uh, uh look at what's happening right now who are the people we are falling back upon in our times of most uh in our times of like dire need i like it's not the military it's not politician it's our doctors it's our scientists it's our researchers who are going to who are going to ensure that civilization survives this uh so please spare me your stories of action hero saving the world give me more stories about scientists saving the world because that is a story we need to tell the world again and again invest more in science invest more in policy tell our children that the aspiration for when they grow up is not to hit the gym and become bulking brooding gi joes but Although to become scientists there scientist. is a necessity for that as well right wouldn't you agree i mean there is a necessity for warrior stories and a necessity for sort of developing physical strength and endurance uh developing physical strength and endurance for a better and healthier body while you are doing research yes to go out okay. and punch someone in the face no 
No, the, the reason I say that is because, and here, here's sort of mm-hmm. like my conjecture on this is, mm-hmm. is, is that what, what happens often is that the greater the intellectual achievement, the bigger the shadow. Mm-hmm. You know, because what happens mm-hmm. is you, you, you might get lost. And again, this is also based on a fair bit of a conjecture, but you might get lost so much in your mind and in your theories that you will forget that you still have a very na- primal part that you need to address, right? And that's why that's why the that's why the scientist uh, athlete combination. I forget who some Roman philosopher said that the ideal scenario for a, for a cultivated human being is a scholar athlete, right? So sorry, a mm-hmm. scholar, a- yeah, yeah. So you combine both, and and it seems in Roman times, yes. In Roman times, yes. Why is that? When you still had to go to war. Uh, right now, I'm talking on the civilization level. I'm not talking on yeah. uh, the level of India or Pakistan or the China, whoever our current enemy is, um, and that keeps changing. Uh, uh, but what I'm talking about is uh, something that's far deeper. Uh, it science cannot be just mind play and theories. It is mind play and theories and thoughts in play. Uh, scientists have put satellite in space. They have cured pandemics that have uh, that have threatened to wipe out the world. Smallpox is not something that you and I are worried about. Polio is not something that you and I are worried about. Uh, the internet exists. Modern medicine exists. Democracy exists. These are great thinkers, philosophers, scientists putting life lifespans of work in to ensure yeah. that the next generation has a better life, has, the next generation has a better way of going about things. Um, Yes, physical fitness is important to the point of re- he- staying healthy and supple. But uh, uh, why is it that we spend so much more on going to war when time and again it has been proven that uh, the enemy is not the neighbor, but the enemy is going to be invisible. The enemy is a pandemic. The enemy is also visible. The enemy is climate change. Yeah. Uh, I think we are creating the... Uh, uh, we're creating the the wrong villains here. Interesting. So there's one thing that you mentioned in your TED talk where you said mm-hmm. that you know <clears throat> what what you often see uh, mm-hmm. when you when you react to news and when you react to mm-hmm. the politics of the world is the narrative that you're fed. Mm-hmm. Not exactly the decisions that went behind that narrative. You said something along those lines mm-hmm. when you're trying to explain a part of Sashin. And uh, I remember mm-hmm. in in college I had this class around PR where uh, mm-hmm. the, the the terms the axis of evil. Was developed by Sorry, hey, just one yeah. second, just one second. Yeah. I'm going to have you dial back. I'm just replacing the battery on the camera. Sounds sorry, good. give me a second. Good. Yeah, we can pause it. Yeah, uh, so, sorry. Yeah, so like I was yeah. saying, um, so I, I was in this PR class in college and, and uh, they were talking about how George Bush hired this PR agency to come up with an mm-hmm. elaborate narrative that they could you know feed to the American public to justify uh, you know mm-hmm. the wars in Iraq or like why certain countries mm-hmm. were called the axis of evil. And, and so the term axis of evil was developed by a bunch of mm-hmm. PR guys, right? And and so that's when I started to realize that, okay, so narratives are built first. They are cooked first, mm-hmm. and then, you know, given mm-hmm. in your plate and you eat it and then and you mm-hmm. react and then they measure the measure the feedback on that narrative and they shift mm-hmm. and all of, all of those things. Mm-hmm. But in, in Shastin, what you've tried to do, I haven't played the game, mm-hmm. I haven't had the honor. One of my friends recommends mm-hmm. it, um, is, mm-hmm. is, is, you, is you try to place someone uh, as as mm-hmm. a citizen who might be very idealistic in their life and might you know try mm-hmm. to hold the government accountable, and you ask them, "Hey, you're a politician now. Make decisions." Mm-hmm. You know that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So talk to me about that that whole idea. Sure. So a couple of things I want to address here. First, it yeah. was an Ink talk. So a shout out to Ink. Ink is this wonderful community put together by Lakshmi Prasuri. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has everyone from scientists to uh, to entrepreneurs to athletes. Uh, and philosophers in, in a, this wonderful community that convenes a couple of times a year. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, check it out there on YouTube. What I was trying to address is a couple of things. One is that, again, z- xenophobia is something that we are susceptible to. Hmm. Uh, it is something that? that was not, uh, that because historically, xenophobia has. Uh, Historically, I mean, a few hundred thousand years ago, xenophobia might have proven to be useful. Being able to tell your kin from the other and safeguarding your immediate kin, your immediate self and your immediate kin from the other uh, had very strong natural selection benefits. Mm. Uh, but the process of civilization has always been to expand the kin, uh, to expand the kin from your immediate family to your tribe, to from a tribe to your nation, from your nation to the species itself. Yeah. Uh, modern politics or politics has always been to 
to tap into the xenophobia and uh, channel it it's uh, it's what i call uh, or i don't remember who coined the term manufacturing the other where you manufacture an yeah. enemy and uh, you uh, you bring out the audience's very primal fears while manufacturing that enemy uh, that i think that is exactly what they were talking to you about in your pr class uh, what we then shasan it, was it's called, it's called the in group out group theory, theory as well and that's how you push people mm-hmm. to you the right yeah. and the left and th- because everything they do is, is in opposition to this other that they've you know built exactly and there's always a new other the a new other might be a different caste a different uh, uh, a different gender a different religion a different uh, uh, nationality anything mm-hmm. um and we and we seeing that right now we are seeing uh, xenophobia in india and the us all over the world uh, what we try to do in shasan is step behind the smokes and mirrors of modern politics uh, was put you in the driver seat it's uh, what i like to call the antagonist theory uh, the, which is basically if i put you in the position of your of the antagonist of the person who is working against you mm-hmm. you will be able to see your own weaknesses from their vantage point you will be able to exploit those weaknesses from their vantage point and when you zoom back out you will know better uh, you will know your weaknesses better yeah so in shasan the antagonist that you play is the politician you understand every trick in the book that politician uses from manufacturing the other to uh, to lobbying for funds with uh, with a capitalist who might not have your best interest in at at heart to playing the pr machinery uh to just like what trump did just say ridiculous things every day to get free mileage every day and become popular yeah and boris johnson very well just doubled down on that uh and you see spokespersons like, yeah. in indian politics uh build their entire careers or become a great or gain great renown by doing just that uh was the idea is to understand the smoke uh, what happens when the smoke and mirrors and tell people or show people why politicians do what they do and say what they say hmm. and we so what happened was uh, two of my co-founders uh, khushbu ranka and minesh shukla uh, spent 3 years in delhi uh, from the in, from the iic movement till the first election uh, which the aap fought and documented everything uh they were in closed door meetings in public rallies everywhere trying to understand how modern politics works and they were given access or were they yes you know, they were given or, access like full access to understand the the whole bulwark of like why you know mr kejriwal might make a decision x or decision y that sort of thing yeah they were given complete access even into their homes and offices interesting uh so the film uh the film went on to uh first be blocked by the censor board significant man right yes it first went it, it premiered at tiff then it went on to get blocked by the indian censor board uh, which which then went up to the supreme court uh, which is a case we won and set legal precedent against censorship in india after which uh, it it released theatrically in india Why and did phenomenal because because it's it's not oh, it's, it's it's it wasn't an ambiguous because of of uh, indian politics and 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 the of, uh, let's not talk about some let's not let's not talk about something that is not against uh, the grain of a propaganda classic goebbels i see i see i see <laughs> uh <laughs> while the film was not pro kgy it wasn't uh, it wasn't pro ap or pro kgy or, or anti modi it yeah. was just a documentation of what happened as a matter yeah. of fact the party no one from the party saw it till it had premiered because we wanted no interference from anyone uh and since ap was playing on the uh on the mandate of uh of being transparent uh they could not refuse access turns out uh, khushbu and vinay were the only ones who asked uh but what happened was through khushbu and vinay and they are they are five year journey in making the film i learned a lot about modern politics that an uh and we decided how now how do we make this learning more intuitive and we sat down and we built a board game now why a board game is a question i almost always get it was on because my mind just before right? that yeah <laughs> yeah just before that i was making virtual reality and 
uh, pioneering virtual reality tech. So why am I transitioning, transitioning from VR to board games? Uh, the first answer is that because I, I like to be medium agnostic, I don't like to tie myself down to a medium. I want to tell the story in the best way it, could, it can be told. Uh, the, I, the, the, the end goal is to get the idea out there, not to make a film or make a game. Hmm. Now, having said that, we select our medium of choice and what would be best. Now, why board games hit the sweet spot was it was interactive. So uh, you have to play with the machine to understand how it works. And that interactive learning is deeper, better, much richer. At the same time, it's interpersonal. Uh, I wanted a tool that allowed you to talk to your family, your friends about politics. And if talking online uh, helped you understand politics better, then... Uh, we wouldn't be here. Uh, we wouldn't be here. Twitter would be heaven. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we said, we said, let's go offline. Let's get people to sit on a table and talk about politics without talking about each other's specific politics. So th- what Shasan does is creates a veneer of... The, politi- the politics of the character you are playing as opposed to yourself. So you mm. can pick policies that you don't believe in or pick policies that you believe in and always say, no, that's not what I, what I believe in. So it gives you a safe space to play in. Interesting. Uh, so you can discuss politics, beliefs, uh, be on the same page, argue it out while having fun. Yeah. So fun is the, is, is, is the pill. It's the, it's the sugar coating on top of the pill. Understanding of modern politics is the medicine inside the pill. Okay, so in in terms of learning environments, right? Because there's been a fair bit mm-hmm. of research on how people learn best, right? And mm-hmm. uh, considering the the limited literature I've read on that, I've I've come across mm-hmm. these two terms. One is a kind mm-hmm. learning environment where the rules are known, mm-hmm. um, you know, mm-hmm. where where procedures are repeatable, where everything mm-hmm. in the game is is just following the rules, knowing all all the ins and outs, and just repeating success, right? In in mm-hmm. the in, in the domain of a chessboard, right? You can know all the combinations mm-hmm. and that sort of thing, right? And then there, mm-hmm. there are wicked learning environments, right? Where the rules are incomplete, missing, or even against you. The players are unknown, mm-hmm. and uncertainty is the mm-hmm. norm, right? So, mm-hmm. wouldn't you say that uh, you know a board game or any of these games are in fact kind learning environments? Like, w- what about the elements of chaos in this one, like in the real world? How do you combine uh, that? So a game like chess is uh, a two-player game like chess is a is a kind learning environment because in chess yeah. uh, allegiances are known. Uh, your chess opponent can never be your ally. Mm-hmm. In chess, uh, human behavior is uh, is condensed to a very straight fundamental uh, mathematical goal to a point that even uh, even an AI can play chess. Uh, as a matter of fact, AI plays chess better than humans. Yeah, um, or actually, in actually Shasen, humans and AIs together play better at chess than humans and AIs alone. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, the, it, it's it's in this book by David Epstein, which I keep mentioning. It's called Range, and mm-hmm. Gary Kasparov lost against mm-hmm. an AI computer, and so, so uh, they he lost is, against uh, Watson. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that. And then what they did is they yeah. they, they they teamed up with. So what he did is he got two programmers, one computer, mm-hmm. and one and one Gary Kasparov on one side, and some other combination mm-hmm. on the other side of only computers, and they won. Because you have the chess master, you have the technical mm-hmm. specialist, and you have the machine. Mm-hmm. It was crazy. But yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. I have the book. I should read it. Uh, um, yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. I have the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, what I was saying was uh, what Shasan does and what a lot of modern, modern board games do is there are a lot of variables within the game that are finite, that, you, mm-hmm. uh, that are mathematical certainties. But there is a huge mathematical uncertainty in the game, uh, of, in the multiplayer game of Shasan, which is your opponents. Hmm. Which, uh, because everyone is fighting each other, the, and a game of Shasan will have its own ups and downs. It, it's going to have uh, uh, alliances being made and broken. It's going to have backstabs and handshakes. Uh, and that keeps you on the edge. That is something that will... Uh, Keep the game uncertain till the very last second. Because more than playing, while you're also playing the math of the board game, you're also playing each other constantly. Mm. It's a game of understanding trust and uh, deceit. It's a game of knowing how far to uh, stretch uh, uh, to stretch your luck and with, with, with other people. And uh, I think that is where the beauty of modern board games lies. Where outside the final variables, there's an infinite variable of the people you're playing with. Yeah, and yeah, the personalities that, that emerge. 
that's where it really gets interesting. So my next question mm-hmm. to you naturally is then there are certain people, everyone has mm-hmm. those people in their life who, who have mm-hmm. high moral standards, who are supposedly mm-hmm. very idealistic, right? So, and you've mm-hmm. obviously seen a couple of these people play, because I know there's a YouTube mm-hmm. version where you had like the Shashan Cup and everything, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. considering that you are also friends with several idealistic people, what happens mm-hmm. when they're they're made to play as, let's say, you know, Trump or Putin or when they're made, how, do, first of all, do they make choices against their idols? And second, <coughs> by it? because in their personal life, there are these, you know, giant moral savages, that sort of thing. So, unlike other games in Shasin, you're not assigned a character. You build your character. Uh, you build your personality by answering a question every turn. Hmm. Now, you can answer the question and build your ideology depending on how you really feel. Hmm. Or in that moment, to get that particular vote bank or capture a particular territory, you might go down the slippery slope of saying something that you don't believe in. Uh, and uh, as a matter, and there's also a temptation of of tasting the evil. So yeah. very very so often in Shasin, you will find the you find people taking stands. You'll find people saying things that are polar opposites of what they believe in real life. Either to see what it feels like or to win that win the game in that particular moment. So again, no one's made to say anything. Everyone everything is a choice. And unless you don't make choices, the game doesn't move forward. Uh, I have had people stick by their beliefs and uh, and win, and I have had people break their belief systems, get greedy, and also win. So it's <laughs> there's no there's no right way of playing the game. So that is, I have to get this game. It's a <laughs> Kickstarter, right? <laughs> yes, the Kickstarter got over. We are still doing pre-orders on backer kit. We were supposed to ship this month, but. Uh, Given what's happening worldwide, it's slightly delayed. We're waiting yeah. for a prototype to arrive from China so that I can give a go ahead on the final manufacturing. But just still tied up. Yeah, man, I, I'd love to get my hands on this game. I, I think I have enough <laughs> uh, political aspirants in my own household to see how that maps. <laughs> because you know, one thing I was talking to you about, you know, how playing board games mm-hmm. before uh, and you know being inspired by Shashin to buy whatever board games I could get my hands on. So what mm-hmm. happens is, you know, let's say you know, considering that it's a nuclear family and I'm back home to safeguard against COVID because I didn't have enough resources mm-hmm. in Mumbai. So there's mm-hmm. the fathers, there's the mothers, there's the sister, and there's me, right? And everyone has different characteristics, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, let's mm-hmm. say the dad is your typical dad, protector, stable, stoic, that sort of thing, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But when it comes to victory, it turns out he will do whatever it takes to win, right? And he, mm-hmm. even going against the, the very natural idea of, you know, like the sacrificial patriarch, that sort of thing, right? And, and mm-hmm. so will the mother, right? And then so will mm-hmm. the sister and so will the son, right? So you suddenly see, mm-hmm. even in games which are not as complex and as fun as Shasin, that, that, mm-hmm. that those sides, that those innate mm-hmm. sides, that the winner comes out. No one is playing these mm-hmm. games to just participate. Everyone has an innate <laughs> desire to win, right? And it's only yeah. those consolation statements come around only when they lose. And so, so it's, it's very <laughs> interesting to step outside those, those familial mm-hmm. roles and get inside the roles of player one, player two, player three, player four. I don't know. Wh- mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Uh... I think it it uh, it is just layers of stacks and stacks of complexity built on the very fundamental play that we did as animals or children, mm-hmm. which is uh, uh, which is that there is a safe space, a magic circle in which the rules are, are changed and in which the stakes are lowered. So what you're doing is you are fundamentally training for for being cutthroat when you need to. To safeguard yourself, you are you are you are training to uh, to move swiftly and adapt quickly, which are all very important traits for survival. Uh, and I think that comes across very well in uh, uh, in games that are in which uh, the in which the uh, sorry, I'm just getting, I'm just losing. In which the suspension of disbelief is good. Yeah. In which the games that make you believe that you are part of this world for those two hours that you're playing that game. Yeah, it's it's the same thing where um you know in in for example GTA right even the GTA is a bit mm-hmm. of a hedonistic uh you uh-huh. know take take on games because mm-hmm. it's like you you mm-hmm. can you can almost be a successful serial killer as long as you keep evading the police that's the idea right <laughs> uh, and <laughs> but, but it's like yeah it's it's like a free roam party to kill and do whatever you want mm-hmm. the fastest cars. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Zion, I want to take a step uh, in a different direction. 
this is something we were dis- discussing before the podcast as well. It, it doesn't seem natural to arrive at these set, the, the set of realizations and, and to have these specific interests that you have, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, without you either having a vagabond attitude towards learning, you know, learn whatever you can, consume voraciously, or mm-hmm. uh, the other perspective where you decided that, you know, the best strategy to understand the world that I'm in, to understand reality itself, and then to, you know, make my mm-hmm. own dent on it, is to is to mm-hmm. break things down into their most concrete bits and then learn them step by step, slow and methodical, mm-hmm. and the other, you know, obviously being random and all over the place. So starting from, you know, you are a kid in Mumbai, how did you start to gravitate toward wanting to learn about the world? Talk to me about that. Uh, so I... I was I was never the best student in class. I, I did decently well until the point where things got too abstract for me to understand why I'm learning what I'm learning. Hmm. Uh, and that is what hugely uh, disillusioned me from classical education. After my hmm. 12th grade, I, I dropped out, uh, much to the dismay of my parents, and uh, started doing my own thing. Uh, which what, did what mean thing? doing, yeah. uh, which did mean doing jo- odd jobs here and there, and and uh, trying a few failed startups and a bunch of other things and working with people in different industries. But generally, to, you would say in the domain of media, study, technology, to, that sort of thing? Engineering? Not always, not always. Uh, but at the same time, there was always a constant learning that I was that I was participating in, be it reading, be it watching things, be it consuming or having conversations with people who knew better than me. Hmm. Uh, and... Uh, See, the, 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 core, the core of my belief system is the scientific method. And the scientific method fundamentally dictates that uh, first, that be ready to accept that whatever rules you hold dear might just be wrong. And you might have to, uh, and that's something that people don't understand about the scientific method. And uh, that is something that, uh, that deeply, deeply drives me to be able to know that I might have completely different belief sets two years down the line um, or what I'm saying right now might not hold true. Well, if it doesn't, then what is? And that constant cycle of knowing what is the, what is the latest breakthrough out there, what is the most cutting edge philosophical or scientific idea out there has mm-hmm. kept me going and con- has kept me consuming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it it's al- also comes from a lot of privilege. Uh, of coming from an educated family, of of being able to uh, meet mentors and peers who are like minded, who are who are driven, who who are ready to invest in my experiments. So, of course, there's a lot of privilege that I come from in terms of opportunities mm-hmm. uh, and abilities, uh, and it's very important for all of us to acknowledge that. Uh, why do why do why do you think it's important to acknowledge people for acknowledge what you are born into? Uh, be- uh, because if you don't acknowledge what you're born into, you fail to acknowledge what other people are not, and you fail to be inclusive of them in when you design policy or ideas. Mm. So okay, so 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 your idea of wanting to acknowledge the privilege stems from uh, trying to look at the world like Emmanuel Kant would, right? It's like I would make a decision so that I, everyone else could also make the same decision. So I would have to act in a way that is the best decision for everyone else. That sort of idea, right? So wh- when you when you're saying this statement, you're not saying it for yourself. You're saying it for society at large. Yeah, and and and, uh, and society at large uh, is a concept that arises from my own personal heuristic model. So I have to first understand the rules I have to I, I hold myself by, and yeah. then transpose those views on any on anything else like an external society or family unit. Uh, so yeah, I think it's very important for us to when we when we talk about experimentation and journey and our learning to be very be very cognizant. Mm-hmm. of our privilege because there definitely exists a peer of mine out there who is smarter, more inventive, uh, uh, and uh, more efficient than me, more empathetic yeah. than me, who is not on this podcast simply because they didn't have the opportunities. Sure. So, that, oh, uh, so yeah. So it's because they, have, they didn't have the opportunities, <laughs> you know? Back at them, but but what, what I want to say is so acknowledging mm-hmm. that you're you know born mm-hmm. in privilege or have had opportunities is separate from mm-hmm. from the casual guilt that is peddled toward you all the time, right? Where where people will literally guilt you uh, into mm-hmm. checking your privilege or or constantly take perspective. It's like how much perspective can you take? You're doing the best you can, right? 
well i think the guilting uh, and i wouldn't call it that or uh, constant right. checking comes for a, from comes from the fact that more people than most people more often than not are not doing that hmm. uh, uh uh we even those even the um, the majority of indian population come doesn't come from the upper caste caste cast of violence is still a very very real thing in india gender violence is a very very real thing in india uh white privilege is a very very real thing in the us mm-hmm. and uh, i think as that there's a lot of introspection that needs to happen uh by uh, by the people who now hold positions of power to constantly reaffirm that inequalities do exist and we must work towards correcting them Yep. because as a species we are only as good as our best ideas and uh, and and it's very important that everyone understand that we need to give equal opportunities and that does not mean being communist uh, to uh, to every person out there irrespective of their caste gender sexual orientation race whatever mm-hmm. I see. So, so when it comes so to- dialing back to what I was saying, uh, yeah. So as a, so growing up, I had the privilege and opportunity of meeting interesting people, of reading interesting things. I had the I had an elder brother uh, who read who reads voraciously, and even now. Uh, even now, and growing up, he would read thirty books, and he would he would weed out the best three for me. So a lot of a lot of curation that went into my learning is thanks to him. Yeah, he was the Spotify uh, of reading for you. Yeah, he was he, he was Spotify and Goodreads and everything else combined of reading for me. He was yeah. uh, uh, so what I didn't learn in school, I learned through him. Uh, and the books he recommended and the ideas he shared, and that includes everything from pop culture to uh, to philosophy and science. Um, after I dropped out, uh, I knew that dropping out with and and surviving with my current skill set is going to be impossible. Thriving doubly so. so i know that i i knew that i had to scale up and that is something i that i strongly believe in that unlike the post industrialization world where people were schooled so that they could uh, they could make good labor forces in the modern world whatever skill you have might be obsolete in a decade we that. are seeing more uh, we are seeing more and more people uh, lose their jobs uh there is this beautiful uh uh ai that uh, my uh friend anand uh, introduced me to it's called talk to transformer and uh it's it's a very small project but it's so fascinating to think into giving us perspective on uh, where the technology is headed because the uh, the long held notion that creative jobs will be the last one being taken away by ai is completely shattered by that uh, by Taku Ransformer because you put in three lines and it generates an entire story based on those three lines and, and it generates six more lines and But these lines are more often than not define accurate well, so it's coherent is, it has new ideas yes yes <laughs> it's coherent it has new ideas uh, more often than not and I, like all ml based ais it's going to get better and better Mm-hmm. this is someone's personal project it's not an ibm funded project uh <laughs> and it's just passed through billions and billions of lines of text that humans have spoken and written you know yeah and there's, there's a really that can do that right now in 2020 in my hand to 2030 when google has the ais out there telling stories when netflix yeah. says we don't need to be slave to us uh, we don't need to go out to creators we can create our own content from all the things you already have Yeah, it's a scary idea. I remember uh, sitting on a porch. It's Boston. a fascinating idea, and I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, so I was remember mm-hmm. smoking smoking a joint with my friends uh, on a porch years ago, mm-hmm. and this friend mm-hmm. who looked up this this AI built. So what this AI basically did is it it aggregated I think twenty five hundred Christmas movie scripts to mm-hmm. make its own Christmas script, right? So it's its own mm-hmm. Christmas movie. and it's something mm-hmm. like put put the put the turkey in your mother and then hand me the gloves you know hand <laughs> me the sock that sort of thing it was wild bizarre and you know the a great stoner classic to you know listen to and get high to that sort of thing mm-hmm. but it mm-hmm. it i was convinced at that time ki you know this is never going to be that that special i think people are still going to look to humans for 
making sense of the chaos where you can in, you can aggregate mm-hmm. stories and stuff but the coherency is uh, humans are fundamentally sitting at the driver seat of what how to make things coherent but you're saying mm-hmm. that's not the case anymore so what should people do to brace that the- that will not be the case very soon yeah um as uh like for example james dean is making a comeback in a few years he's been dead for 40 years oh. uh but <laughs> so uh, if whether you're an actor whether you are a writer there is uh, there is a constant need for us to uh, skill up our schooling te- uh, comes from a pre google pre wikipedia era which still allows and the second i said google my phone woke up saying hey yeah. are you remembering me <laughs> um uh, which still comes from a pre google pre wikipedia era of uh, uh of having the onus having the onus of uh, uh of remembering still uh, lying with the with the with the individual in the post google post wikipedia area era, our job is like you said to curate to connect dots to uh mm. to make sense of things and not retain things yeah that is the first step of obsolescence that's going to happen not needing to retain information the second step is to be able to cure, to create meaning that is new that is not something that is an idea that's been out there uh to not make another action movie uh when photography was invented uh the artist realized that their job the painter realized that their job is not any more to make portraits or to record landscapes because that is a job that photographs do better and we saw the great get up people we saw picasso and uh, and uh, other impressionists sorry other cubists and modernists come to light where they took painting and they took away the onus of archiving information hmm. and and focused co- uh, only on new perspectives focused uh, solely on uh, creating new meaning yeah and uh, that is something that is right now a very very human skill and will continue to be so but uh, again the technology we have right now would seem like sci-fi in the year 2000 uh, and uh, even the moore's law is reductive uh, it's very important to understand that uh, our skill sets uh even though they seem like they might not get up upstate as soon as we would like them to uh, mm-hmm. will definitely uh, become uh, will definitely be less needed moving forward now that does not necessarily mean that there's going to be a job shortage we are going to uh, be but it's important to know that the next generation have to be trained to be generalist thinkers as opposed to uh, technicians because yes that's the yeah, thesis of the book range yeah that's range, the thesis yeah. of the book yeah uh because technicians uh like the apple the apple robot in china can disassemble an, uh, uh, an iphone in 13 seconds uh now that's something that you will not be able to match uh so uh a majority of the indian vfx industry depends on manual labor where each a, a character and element is rotoscoped out manually mm. uh all it will take is one plugin from adobe to render multiple people obsolete now what this will do is create more uh, is allow people to uh to do better things with their th- with their life as opposed to doing just technical uh procedural work uh the word computer didn't stand for a machine the computer used to be a job role given to people who would literally sit all day and crunch numbers that job role uh title was then given to a machine and to a point that we have most of civilization has forgotten that the computer used to be a person till landing till landing 50s that. that's crazy till landing 50s the computer was a job role so this so everything from was to calculate like chacha chaudhary you know was kadama computer just do math just do just sit in box, in rows and rows and rows and do math all day from everything from engineering to uh, economics damn so what should people do in terms of because i know for a fact like my my dad works in real estate for instance and he, he mm-hmm. still sort of has that work where he has to go and meet people and you know mm-hmm. uh, make sense of a lot of uh, 
uh, negotiations deals and all of that right and, and and that's something that's a skill that he's developed over you know years mm-hmm. of working in that industry right um, mm-hmm. but it, it it does come at risk when in times like these where you know the computer is king right and those of us who even made a dent in this industry who dipped their beak mm-hmm. in to see what was happening are suddenly at mm-hmm. an advantage because the attention is here right um, mm-hmm. now I also believe in this idea, right? And this has sort of been peddled in pop culture already through the likes of famous self-help thinkers like Tim Ferriss, right? And everyone else who's propounding mm-hmm. like for optimizing and automating your life around your jobs uh, to make money and then mm-hmm. spend your other time developing skills that are completely disparate, that have no real connections among each other. So that you that allows mm-hmm. you to always have an outsider's advantage to the, the, the mm-hmm. field of a specialist because you can think in mm-hmm. ways that, you know, they cannot because their nose is too deep to the, you know, too close mm-hmm. to the grindstone, that sort of idea. That's mm-hmm. the reason why, you know, the governments like Niti Ayog or this company called Innocentive, that's why they they they, they pull in like uh, suggestions from uh, the population to solve specific problems because this, they're, they're just mm-hmm. not as invested and they can see mm-hmm. problems from multiple perspectives. So what sort of skills do you think people can can benefit from in, in, in the future? I know writing and speaking uh, definitely help. Yeah, so communication skills, being able to translate your ideas from in, from into an image, into a paragraph, into a, a poem or a, a speech is great. But I think the core skill that anyone needs to have is being able to understand first principles. Uh, you don't necessarily need to remember uh, how each molecule of, of how one element will react to an, another. If, if you know the core fundamental principles of how orbits and spins work. So understanding uh, the building blocks of whatever you're studying, uh, whatever you are interested in is very, very important. Uh, it could be understanding matrices that are going that the go behind game design or uh, understanding the core fundamental building blocks of physics. Why, if you are a theoretical physicist, mm. uh, that is the first skill that uh, first principles so foundational the first knowledge that people need to as learn. opposed to foundational knowledge of temporary knowledge the, yeah and uh, as opposed to also data because okay. again that is something that you can outsource to someone else and it's, it's going to be very interesting to see the next generation grow up the, people, the children who uh, who are uh, like Khushbu uh, one of my co-founders and a, and a close friend has uh, was talking to us the other day and she was talking to us about her nephew and her nephew, uh, whenever in the family someone does something funny or someone breaks out into a dance in a celebration, uh, has an instinctive response of asking for the phone to take a photo. Because this three-year-old already knows that the job of recording something that is, uh, that is unique, that is fun, that is exciting, can be outsourced to an external gadget and they don't need to do it themselves. Hmm. And that's deeply fascinating. Uh, we won't need to retain data anymore. We won't need to uh, pass through pages or remember pages and pages of uh, information. We don't need to compete in the spelling bee because autocorrect exists. Yeah. But isn't that, uh, that also uh, an antithesis of, you know, losing out on specific skills? Because, you know, what if we stop? What if we forget how to fucking add add numbers, you know? What if we forget how to, um, you know, being able to just use your, your mind's gears to, to figure out the spellings of words, right? Uh, what if Socrates what if, was was famously opposed to writing. Yeah, I mean, wasn't all yes. his uh, all his teachings penned down by Aristotle? Yes, he was famously opposed to it because way, if yeah, uh, yeah uh, he was famously opposed to it because uh, again to paraphrase if. Uh, it, it would make the mind dull and weak if the job of the memory was taken away from it. Wow. Uh, that belief system still holds. Well, people, computers don't exist as people anymore. If someone can do mental maths really well, it's a good party trick. But there is no real reason <laughs> uh, why you should know that skill. Uh, it's great if you can spell a word that is 16 alphabet strong, but do you really need it? I mean, fuck. Do you honestly really need it? 
I'm just thinking about all the times uh, that I was at the US and I took, I hated math classes in general, mm-hmm. but I had to take one mandatory, right? Uh-huh. And I was surprised to see that unlike India, unlike, unlike CBSC boards, uh, you know, mm. uh, where you had to memorize all the theorems, all the formulas, all the mm. ideas, right? Everything uh-huh. was given to you in a cheat sheet by the examiner and all you had to do was apply them. I was like, okay, that's why these kids are not as smart at math because, you know, we just are better at that. <laughs> So it, it was surprising to me that that, that was already outsourced. Um, this was back in mm-hmm. 20, 20, 2016. But um, mm-hmm. so you say, so, so according to Socrates and now according to you, as you paraphrase it, there is no real advantage. No, right? so I, I, I'm, I'm opposed to uh, Socrates' belief. He, he, he was being a Luddite when he said, don't write. And okay. using him as a cautionary tale. Hmm. The same way people are now, no, autocorrect is bad. It, no, it's not. It's better. Yeah. It doesn't make you look like a fool when you when you type something out wrong. <laughs> so, wait, do you write yourself? Yeah, I do, but uh, I always have my autocorrect and Grammarly on, just to make sure. What about what about the the idea of writing? You know, using pen and paper, that sort of idea. I think I think. Oh, I haven't h- held one in a decade. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you. I don't know how to hold one anymore. That's weird, man. <laughs> I you would really like this. Uh, I have this. Uh, uh, this uh, this person who came to my podcast, her name is Aditi Sarana, and she's a graphologist. Mm-hmm. So what she does is she analyzes, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it, it's an incomplete analysis. She uses other, other tools as well, but she analyzes your mm-hmm. personality traits based on your handwriting. Mm-hmm. And she's like, my majority of my clients are people who haven't held a pen and haven't written something in decades. I, and it's like, so people forget how to write, but I, I still think there's... Yeah. It's 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 a it's it's a great great skill. It's a, it's a refreshing feeling. I do it every single day. But I don't know. Yeah, penmanship is is craft at best. But uh, if some if a graphologist was about to analyze my handwriting, uh, yeah. the analysis would be this is a three year old three year old kid learning how to write. Yeah, because because you were not used to it. Yeah. So talk to me about consistency and habits. Because considering that you realize that we're heading to a future where you know, uh, skills will be the commodity mm-hmm. that you can, you know, buy your place at the table at and make sure that you're, you know, making money and, and, and thriving. W- what sort of skills are you looking to develop specifically and are, are you are developing mm-hmm. in the process? I mean, so uh, to complete the earlier thought, one, understanding first principles and two, being able to connect vast disparate thoughts. Yeah. Uh, like you said, uh, yeah. yeah, system thinking, exactly. Uh, like you rightly said, uh, uh, solutions come from unlikely places and that's where organizations like the XPRIZE exist. Now the XPRIZE is a fascinating, or- the, X- the XPRIZE, mm-hmm. it's a fascinating organization that puts bounties on problems that, ha- that happen around you, that, that humanity is facing. And if you win the bounty, the, your solution is open sourced and, uh, and, the, the, and humanity has benefited. Uh, they have put bounties on everything from... I get emails from this my this parallel company called Mind Sumo, and they have prices for okay. several so several mm-hmm. companies who have sort of mm-hmm. uh, solutions that can be you know extrapolated to the rest of humanity. Mm-hmm. So they'll put these mm-hmm. out, and, and each one will have a price saying five hundred dollars, five thousand dollars, that sort of thing. So I, I mm-hmm. think I think there's there's so, more than one company then. Hmm. Yeah, so Xprize talks cool. about only that only larger issues. It talks about everything from space travel to. Uh, a water desalination to uh, stopping oil spills to uh, to uh, urban agriculture so larger issues and the bounties range from anywhere from million dollars to 10 million dollars right and the rule sets are very defined this is the cost we need these are the metrics that need to, need to hit uh, uh, the solution to that the bounty they, and again I'll send you a link about this in, you can put sure. it in the description I'll put it in the do- uh, description this, yeah yeah yeah, the solution to uh, ocean spillage came from four unlikely uh, uh, engineers from uh, from the US who had nothing to do with oil spillage or uh, ocean engineering. They just knew from their day job on how to clean up oil really fast. I I think I know about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, similarly, uh, the idea that you put a bounty on a, on 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 a, on a problem and ask people from different disciplines to come together. Allows from allows for different people from different disciplines who wouldn't normally be at the table to talk yeah. to each other, uh, and uh, that is one skill that I think is going to define uh, leaders. Now, while I'm not a big fan of jobs, 
his hmm. code skill was not coding he never wrote, wrote a line of code in his, di- uh, in his uh, life jobs steve jobs uh, yeah. yeah i thought he meant like uh, jobs as in like actual jobs no sorry no yeah steve jobs uh, yeah. his his code skill was not coding his code skill was in design uh, uh johnny i did most of his uh, popular designs uh, his core skill wasn't also marketing he had entire teams for that uh, what he knew was to be the, the generalist in the center making all these disparate ideas work together to create a cohesive product right uh, and that is i think what is the core skill of the future being being a systems thinker mm-hmm. and that is and the first step to doing that is is breaking away from this romance of simplifying things things are not simple they are not meant to be simple the world is complex everything from choosing your partner to choosing where to live in has multiple uh, variables that you need to account for and sometimes the decisions need to happen very very quickly so we need to train ourselves to think com- uh, to com- to think to account for multiple variables in a short mm. span of time mm. uh and uh, games films books that allow you to deal with complex ideas and parse them simultaneously uh, are a good way of training people to think that way yeah so what would you say to people who are who still find themselves cognitively overloaded by the complexities that they face every single day what what is the way um, to job at it uh now i don't have a different answer to that and uh, which is why i we can speculate m- yeah my yeah my day job is doing is creating tools for exactly that uh uh with shasan i've created tools for understanding uh modern politics my next few ge- uh, games deal with other complex structures that we find ourselves in hmm. uh and my job is to and job of content creators is to break down the most cutting edge ideas in science and philosophy into hmm. very very consumable units of culture hmm. uh so if they are not able to break through complexity and understand things all they need to do is uh there are two parts of the problem one they need to keep at it and keep understand and keep trying uh to deal with complex ideas and keep trying to juggle multiple thoughts at the same time while uh while pressurizing content creators to tell deeper complex nature stories mm-hmm. uh, and not incentivize uh reactive uh content creators with likes shares ticket money take away the vanity matrix and everyone will stop selling you junk food you know that that's a yeah, good idea yeah exactly and junk culture yeah junk culture is a thing yeah, it man, took us 40 I'm, years I'm to that. it took us 40 years to agree that junk culture is possibly a thing and it should be bad and could be bad for you and should be healthier you are what you eat you are also what you watch on and what you consume i'm 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 thorough on this yeah. so there's Mm-hmm. so my entire covid-19 uh, routine mm-hmm. has been to mm-hmm. try out this low media diet that the tim ferris keep preaching keeps preaching i felt a mm-hmm. need for it right what i find mm-hmm. is a couple mm-hmm. of things happened um this is something that you know cal newport the, the famous author mm-hmm. of digital minimalism and deep work and another book called mm-hmm. so good they be so good they can't ignore you talks about how mm-hmm. we've lost touch with solitude and boredom but not in that sort of trite sense where he's just you know shaming you but he says that fundamentally mm-hmm. what's happening is you know since we're parsing through a news feed of random information mm-hmm. while thinking mm-hmm. about what ways to buy for your apartment while also dealing mm-hmm. with theoretical problem in your head right your attention is fragmented right and with fragmented mm-hmm. attention you lose out right and so his hypothesis which i beginning to believe the more i think about it is to not mm-hmm. lose your mind is to rem- is to is to keep still amid all this chaos mm-hmm. is to violently edit out uh, as mm-hmm. much randomness as you can in in this mm-hmm. junk food domain and then but entertain randomness in your physical world w- w- what do you mm-hmm. think about that how do you focus how do you make sense of uh, you know junk culture and 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 trying to think among um, among all of these different distractions so i think i believe in not filtering out randomness i think i think uh, I said, uh, random, filtering out randomness yeah. filtering filtering out randomness uh, leads to uh, echo chambers i love randomness i love hearing opposing views uh, yeah. what i believe in is, is is filtering out things that are not good for you so if you see a a really really fun meme but uh, you sp- or a great cooking video but mm. you're not going to be cooking anytime soon or cooking that thing anytime soon uh or those deeply satisfying montages yeah uh, or or celebrity gossip and none of that has any u- utility for you 
and it might, but if it doesn't, just unfollow. Facebook and Google have created algorithms that are that are deeply engineered to give you what you like. Now you can reverse engineer these algorithms to good, right. And no, manufacture your own news feed where it's devoid of junk culture. So every time you find junk on your feed, uh, don't show me more of this. Every time you do that on your Google News, on your Facebook, on your Twitter feed, everywhere. Uh, curate, uh, allow randomness to exist. Allow uh, things that uh, allow topics that you wouldn't be uh, interested in otherwise to come your way. But if after consuming it, you feel, hey, this is useless, just move it out or this is uh, this is appealing to more primal instincts filter it out hmm. so again stay random but uh make sure you're, you're eating clean uh, clean protein and carbs in your culture not not fat and sugar yeah i love that uh, so what is your what is your media diet look like though because here's what i want to get at right so considering hmm. that you are a knowledge worker considering that you know your thesis hmm. around the sort of thing that you want to do in life is to is to decomplexify mm-hmm. these systems and make them consumable for people to understand the world that we're in and to gamify a lot of the mm-hmm. the, the hardness that is out there. Uh, how mm-hmm. d- do you focus? Like, what is what is what is your what is your daily routine look like? Right? It could be. It doesn't have to be grand. Maybe you say like, you know, I I watch four hours of Simpsons and I'll be fine with that. But I'm trying to understand mm-hmm. that. You know, uh, how are you able mm-hmm. to retain mm-hmm. almost complete but always searching for the truth esque uh, you know uh, hypotheses around all of these different subjects without mm-hmm. being constantly bombarded by all the stimulus i use the mute features and the unfollow features vigorously but even mm-hmm. then that i find that you have to create physical separations between the sort of media that you consume and and what is your work right so so that's mm-hmm. what i want to get at so i i have what would classically be called terrible consum- consumption habits, but I don't think so. Uh, mm-hmm. I consume everything all the time uh, yeah. to a point that it uh, uh, it borders on uh, being uh, attention deficit. Uh, I uh, I am constantly consuming the content on Facebook, on Google News, on uh, uh, on uh, everything from Nine Gag to Reddit to 4chan. Uh, I'm constant uh, to Google dot scholar to books that I'm reading. Uh, I wake up in the morning consuming things and I'm consuming all day long. Uh, the only thing that I don't consume a lot of is fiction because I have no patience for it. Interesting. Even though I dabble in creating it, I have no patience for fiction. Uh, that- apart from occasional TV show or, or, or a series that I follow, I rarely watch films, fiction films or, uh, or I have not read a fiction book in a decade. What's the what's the aversion to fiction? Is it because you're like I know what's going to happen? I, have you no, figured it's just out? Boring. It's much ado about about nothing. Like I don't care about what what happened in the person's life. What is the idea behind it? Yeah. You give, give me the idea and move on with it. So you want to aggregate fast and move on? Yeah, I want to aggregate fast and move on, and, and I don't I couldn't care less about what happened in the fictional character's life. Interesting. Yeah, and and it's funny that you know still so much of what you do is is based around stories, but you you come at it from mm-hmm. from a, a non uh, you know character uh, approach. Mm-hmm. It's, that's really fascinating. Huh? It's, it's, so it's I really, I, yeah. I consume fiction and non-fiction. Uh, uh, so for characters, I think non-fiction is a better place to go because what fiction does is create uh, loops of exag- exaggeration. Someone created an archetype and then someone exaggerated it, and then you have Tarantino making films about films where people are where people are referring to other films it's like why uh, yeah i mean uh, apart from that exception <laughs> I, I still i still what i will say about fiction is that it allows you it allows you to imagine after you've read and it allows you to imagine as mm-hmm. you go along um, i mean obviously mm-hmm. some some fiction can be very didactic they'll say mm-hmm. exactly <laughs> what, what what the person smells like it's not needed but great writing you know like some russian writers mm-hmm. like chekhov dostoevsky indian writers like mm-hmm. Thiel, right they will paint pictures mm-hmm. and, and and they will they will aggregate and 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 mm-hmm. have detail when they have to uh, certain things mm-hmm. that y- you don't often think about but they just have to articulate it in a certain way and sort of allows you mm-hmm. to to give words mm-hmm. to 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 you know mm-hmm. s- stuff in life that isn't always mm-hmm. so formulaic so hard sciencey that's mm-hmm. it. and that, you know mm-hmm. and that's the sort of school that I try to come from is is to uh-huh. is to see the multiple uh, you know like like a social profiling for once right is such a fascinating uh-huh. thing. Best friend and I used to do. We used to get high. Mm-hmm. These are our first mm-hmm. formative years of getting high, and we would just mm-hmm. drive around in cars and like just uh, 
you know, look at that person and say, Iski shadi ho rakhi hai. he has two kids, but he, one of them is like sort of bad at school and he definitely mm-hmm. scratches his balls, you know, like that sort of thing. And it allows you to do it, it. All of it comes mm-hmm. from fiction, from, from watching and reading mm-hmm. stories. Oh yeah, that, that's mm-hmm. my feel for fiction because yeah. I felt like, you know, someone must speak so, fiction. <laughs> I consume fiction only academically to understand tropes, to understand structures, to understand narrative uh, okay. uh, patterns, because when I do create them, I don't want to, I don't want to, repeat things that are obsolete. Uh, yeah. So to understand from academic and a professional understanding of fiction. Uh, I, but I think uh, good fiction, uh, it, it makes for good fiction when the world of fiction is, is well, uh, well painted. It's, it's, it's well etched out. The world is very, very real and has very strong bearings in the world that we find ourselves in. Uh, so uh, my co-founder Anand uh, was, has been writing this, uh, uh, film for a while and I've been helping him with the writing. The film's called Emergence mm-hmm. and we started writing it in 2014-2015 and it's a film uh, about a global pandemic. Uh, and the idea was to call the film, uh, to release the film sometime this year but we just kept writing it for a while and production and we are neck deep in pre-production and now we realized that a lot of things that we predicted in the in the film have exactly panned out in the real world because our storytelling didn't come from from uh, our storytelling came from understanding science from understanding politics and understanding how the world actually functions why a pandemic would happen where it would happen how it would travel what was the, what would the world's reaction to it be and it's at some places it's uncanny and some places we are like, oh, great. Now we don't have to do a lot of explaining that we wouldn't, that we would have to do in the film in the first place. Interesting. Because the context is something for context change entirely. And now we can, we can talk, we don't have to spend time talking about things that people already know about, like mm-hmm. rates of infection and are not numbers. Uh, so a lot of fiction, a lot of fiction that we create is deeply based around, uh, uh, around uh, the world we see ourselves in, uh, and uh, like for example, uh, two of my other co-founders, Pooja Shetty and Neil Pagidar, are writing a uh, have just finished shooting a science fiction comedy. Mm. Uh, science fiction comedy. With a- yeah, with AI as one of the central themes. I can't tell you more right now, but uh, yeah. a lot of a lot of a lot of work in 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 the journey of creating this project has gone into studying the future of AI. Mm-hmm. Which is why uh, what right now is just referred information from what the research they have done and passed passed along my way. Uh, so as filmmakers, as storytellers, as game creators, we spend a lot of time uh, passing through and studying the world around us because I think uh, I think that is what keeps the stories relevant, important, and urgent. Interesting. So uh, talk to me about how. Because you said game game designers, filmmakers, you know, and technologists. I don't know mm-hmm. if you mentioned technologists, right? Uh, but mm-hmm. but how, how does this the set of uh, first of all are these disparate people with, from disparate backgrounds, and second, mm-hmm. how do they come together? What 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 is the what do the idea jams look like, right? Uh, and and how mm-hmm. do you come around consensus? Do you follow? Do you guys follow a circular model like the Girl Scouts, where where one circle it's like concentric circle of of uh, you know talking and communication, or do you follow like a clear mm-hmm. hierarchy? How, how do you how do you give, give these ideas to fruition? Is what I'm asking. It's a bit of both. Uh, when the idea is is being fleshed out, we hear everyone out. Everyone will play Shasan in its formative uh, few versions and and come come at it with their expertise, with their uh, with their interests and their insights. Uh, but everything, while being very very collaborative, is also driven driven by authors. So if I'm making something, I'm going to hear everyone out. But the final uh, call is of the author. So if Pooja and Neela would, are making something, everything you see in the film or the show is their authorship. None of us have any say on what goes in the final product, except them. Uh, none of us have any, had any say in an insignificant man uh, outside of uh, Kushbu and Vinay. And uh, while everyone was on board giving idea on Shasan, the final say was mine. So if I fuck up or if I create something that's worthwhile, I, I bear the responsibility, I bear the glory. 
Yeah, so it's like you you will you will take input liberally, but you will put out something very conservatively, right? It's it's the same idea of being a collector. Uh, I wouldn't use the word conservatively. I would put out I would put out something with my own authorial stamp on it. It's my it's my it's my bottom line. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And, and so, you know, I mean, I could talk to Anand a fair bit about this, you know, in, in mm-hmm. the future, because I would love to have mm-hmm. you both on when all of this ends mm-hmm. to sort of, you know, like do, do mm-hmm. a jumbo jam of conversations about, you know, mm-hmm. how people from disparate backgrounds are doing, you know, to not talk about like, oh, my God, this is happening in India. So cool. But actually, this is what I want to say. This is happening mm-hmm. in India. And it's so mm-hmm. cool. Um, what what uh where exactly in culture do you find uh, meme, uh, memesis to be in, right? Are you at the fringes? Are you, are you right with the indie crowd? Uh, w- what intersections are you, are you working in right now? Uh, so while we are, while we do not enjoy the same audience base as something that is more mainstream, like uh, like like traditional Bollywood, mm-hmm. uh, we are slowly making our way into. Uh, getting our ideas, uh, getting the ideas that excite us into more consumable formats. In the next one year, we have projects going out on uh, on three of the major OTD platforms. We have games that are going to be hitting wider and wider audience bases. The idea is to uh, is there is a uh, there is a great divide between what we consider sensible and what we can consider mainstream. Uh, what we consider important and what what we consider mainstream. If anything is relevant, it's not mainstream. Uh, the idea is to n- not make it so. Uh, other countries, uh, other cultures have been able to talk about very important things, uh, been able to shape discourse through mainstream conversation. Uh, Michael Moore is a mainstream filmmaker in the US. Even though he makes documentaries, when his films get put up, everyone knows about them. Yeah. Uh, and the idea, uh, the idea is to create a uh, create institution of of that of that repute out of India telling stories of India for the first time, exporting content and culture to the world as opposed to importing uh, uh, culture. You and I both know, know the difference between Brooklyn and Harlem. Uh, and we have, haven't necessarily grown up, grown, up, grown up there. We have imported so much culture from them. Uh, uh, but uh, how many Americans know the difference between Bombay and Vancouver? Uh, yeah, I want to I wanna talk to you a bunch about that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's such a, it's mm-hmm. such a pain point. It's, I, I make mm-hmm. so much fun of everyone who mm-hmm. writes in their bios. Mm-hmm. I will only mm-hmm. talk to you if you're a Friends fan, right? Because to mm-hmm. think of the ludicrous concept of jacking <laughs> off to the refuse, the 90s refuse of a sitcom <laughs> that was made in America in 2020 mm-hmm. is pathetic, right? And and yeah. thanks to... Yeah, and it hasn't aged well. And that doesn't help. Absolutely not, man. <laughs> Most of these things have not, right? You just have to look at the stuff that we're doing. I mean, thankfully now we're doing stuff in the OTT mm-hmm. content space, but mm-hmm. it's, it's so sad that to fill the gaps that we can't fulfill mm-hmm. ourselves through our own mm-hmm. stories and myths, because, you know, they also mm-hmm. been hijacked by some of our politicians who are, you know, <laughs> of a certain fire brand. But, but, but the point uh-huh. is this, like, because we don't have access to our own culture, stories and myths, and we don't have access to what does. And we haven't spent time creating new myths. Yeah, we haven't. We haven't, right? So what we're basically doing is we're 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 wearing the ref- we're wearing the Uttran of the West, mm-hmm. and and I'm not saying mm-hmm. this in some sort of like you know, uh, fucking like oh everything is bad about the West and look we're sort of self defeatist. But in a way, I'm I am saying that we could do a lot better by by start to by starting to construct our own stories. So we don't have. So it's it's very funny. Like when I when I went to the US. I would know certain things about the USA so much better than, than people mm-hmm. living there. Mm-hmm. I had that outsider's perspective, right? I wanted that bandage. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, and I've had so many friends there. Uh, mm-hmm. I was on someone's podcast very recently who's a Lebanese friend mm-hmm. who also lives in the US. Mm-hmm. He says that, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, aren't you getting people from the Indian community on your podcast? And that's exactly my point because he wasn't able to mm-hmm. grasp the niche of, of what I'm trying to do because from the outside, it's like, oh, Indian talking to Indians, right? Whereas I know exactly mm-hmm. what he's doing with, or what, what Joe Rogan is doing with his podcast. He's getting a bunch of, mm-hmm. you know, he's getting a bunch of fighters, a bunch of comedians, a bunch of thinkers, that sort of thing. I can lay it out. He can. So it's mm-hmm. like, it's very important for, for Indians uh, not to make a grand signing claim here, to, st- to start behaving as if they're not blips on the global radar and to start behaving in a way where uh, we value our niches and we learn about them. We are one sixth of the world's population by conservative estimate. So, yeah. uh, and we should be occupying uh, at least one sixth of the cultural space. Uh, 
and the idea that india is not a mon- monolithic culture has great niches great subcultures great uh, uh, pockets of different kinds of culture and as you travel through the nation you want, or the subcontinent even i wouldn't even i would call it the indian subcontinent uh, where everything from uh, from uh, from pakistan to sri lanka to nepal has such great culture and just mm-hmm. and the culture the historic culture doesn't even need to be great and i don't even claim that the historic culture is the best in the world it's it's yeah. old and much of it is outdated uh, but we need to be telling stories of people of, from here people uh, to people of the nation inspiring them and be of and exporting the stories to the world out there yeah like you said sticking our claim on the cultural sphere that is india or the indian continent yeah uh, yeah american podcasters american uh, journalists american filmmakers do a great job of making american culture cool and accessible john oliver makes politics fun uh, adam mckay made uh, made the 2008 financial crisis fun in big shot uh, and it's everyone's talking about it in a cool fun way and uh, mm-hmm. and that's exactly what filmmakers need to do mm. we the best compliment you can give an indian creator hey is that hey that this doesn't seem like it came out of india and that's sad yeah man yeah yeah <laughs> it's there's something about there's something about you know trying to get past the tropes of snake charmers and elephants uh and and you know uh, exotica and monkeys and mangoes and everyone mm-hmm. laughing and everyone dancing but they're far more convenient and that's what we pedal you know it's like and we need to one. work yeah we need to work yeah. harder absolutely this is what my favorite author g tile says is like it's like you know, i wanted to pay portray a picture of 70s bombay where half, you know half mm-hmm. of the city's dregs uh dregs as in like you know p- people who are out down and out of mm-hmm. their luck are spending time in these opium dens getting high and you know it's it's and so he wanted to say mm-hmm. like look this is a part of india i mean he was clearly lighting for the english audience here in india okay really mm-hmm. also internationally he wasn't trying mm-hmm. to say okay look at the wine color days and everyone sitting in the colonial bungalow enjoying the mangoes and the servant is mm-hmm. right in the corner and he's like and the saib mm-hmm. and the mame saab are sitting there and blah 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 it's all fun and frolic you know the girls are little girls are wearing frocks and the boys are wearing shorts and they're all like you know enjoying the sunlight and now they're by the mm-hmm. sea it's 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 it well you know certain parts of india are very much idyllic i think i think what doesn't get communicated is the nuance and it doesn't get communicated mm-hmm. very well abroad whereas like mm-hmm. you said before you know that's how we started this sort of uh, tangent is is we know exactly the difference between brooklyn and harlem but they they don't know what would you know what mumbai what is the difference between bandra or varsova that sort of thing that's you really that's still too much inside. bombay and bangalore like just let's talk about two different cities in two different corners yeah. <laughs> right right absolutely man yeah so I, i'm really glad about there this is the other sort of thing that i think about often is like you know some some content that is made in regional languages does really well but uh, in i think what it is doing is communicating how awesome mm-hmm. our, our culture is to to our own countrymen i think because of the the, the universality of the english language not a lot of us have come mm-hmm. have done have, have commanded it so much that you know uh, some of our best content can be in english so that we're making for international audiences i think what is happening mm-hmm. right now is worse we need to educate ourselves that we're great and then we can you know start extrapolating out to the world mm-hmm. and uh, it's also it's uh, so a lot of the gatekeepers of indian culture and content are people who are not in the content game for content they are in it to make a quick buck and for the fame of it and uh, yeah. and that's deeply saddening it's not going to survive because uh, again they they time will kick them out but uh, banksy once said that it's uh, i've met so many great artists who are willing to die for their craft but so few willing to uh, to learn how to paint uh, <laughs> so true that is so true uh, and uh, and if you look at the top crossing games out of india do you have any idea what what, what those could be or the, uh, the biggest game out of india uh, ludo and carrom yeah digital games yeah ludo and i had no idea that Karen. they were uh, played abroad oh, no in india they're not being played abroad they're being played by indians but what indians are doing uh, indian creators are doing is they are they are peddling lazy work out there yeah and uh, what lazy work does is it doesn't 
while it might help you capture the market in the short term it also kills the market um uh everything from dota to pubg didn't arise out of someone playing it safe it arrived out of someone someone being inventive counter strike dota league of legends uh pubg and fortnite some of the money they were built by small independent creators sitting out of their bedrooms making custom maps for games that already existed they were innovating on games that already existed that's one thing all the big games have in common pubg was made by brendan green uh, as a map for arma uh, dota was made by a bunch of people uh, including winsu ice frog and a few others uh, for warcraft 3 uh, counter strike was a mod for half life which was then sold in the orange box later uh these were creators trying to create new fun content sorry one second yeah uh, these were creators trying to create new fun content and uh, like them hundreds of other creators tried these one these new formats clicked and created industries that are worth tens of billions of dollars uh what's Karen, what what ludo is going to do is push uh innovators out of the market because they won't be able to survive and keep the market at the small pie that 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 there is yeah uh, we are going to keep like you said no one out of india plays ludo because why would they but everyone from india plays pubg which is a game that was a uh, uh, innovator from the west uh being hired by a korean developer then being acquired by a chinese corporation and being played as the most played game in india that's the market size that we are missing out on yeah it's insane in fact when i was trying to when i was went to buy those we uh, you know those those mm-hmm. board games business and uh, mm-hmm. chess mm-hmm. uh since the the regular shopkeeper wasn't there it was his son so you can imagine like a rookie mm-hmm. trying to learn the art mm-hmm. of of you know mm-hmm. sales and you know isme ye toy wo toy in 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 the mm-hmm. era of the pandemic and uh, mm-hmm. he was a bit clueless right but i wanted to test him i wanted to see like how far he could be this the shopkeeper you know like this sort of idea where mm-hmm. certain shopkeepers will enthusiastically show you ye naya product aaya mm-hmm. is type se ye ye naya wala game aaya right mm-hmm. so i was trying to jog mm-hmm. his his sales muscles to see how far i could stretch it and i said so you mm-hmm. know I've, i've already played ludo and all of these games so give me a different board game so he went mm-hmm. to the back of the store and he came out with this game right and and so he he was avoiding eye contact and you know i understand you know people are sometimes socially awkward mm-hmm. but then then i looked right i really came up close to him and looked into his eyes like i asked him so what is this game about and he tried his best to explain it to me and you know he wasn't the best at it it was called sequence 4 it's a new game that's come out i don't know uh but mm-hmm. but as he was trying to explain it i was thinking about the people i would play it with and i'm like you know th- they're not necessarily open to to mm-hmm. this this new found complexity like hey guys this is a yeah. new board game that we're going to play they're like no 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 Mm-hmm. bring the traditional classics in bring ludo in bring caram in bring some mm-hmm. city in right mm-hmm. bring some kind mm-hmm. of uh, an indian variation of cards in we don't want to experiment with i mean it the, the fucking time it took for jenga to become a you know a uh, cafe coffee day type of ca- cafe classic is is years and mm-hmm. years so I, it's it's very interesting to see how a lot of us are still getting warmed up to the idea that you know there there might be more to our mm-hmm. past times than we're led to believe from all these tropes mm-hmm. that we constantly consume and i'm mm-hmm. really really excited for what comes next in terms of our generations getting slightly older and having slightly more interesting more complex hobbies like practicing mm-hmm. movement in, instead of practicing push ups right or mm-hmm. uh, for for instance you know trying to meditate on a serious question instead of trying to do uh, mm-hmm. pranayama so it's 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 an interesting sort of world mm-hmm. that we're in um but um man it's uh, zion it's been so much fun talking to you it's arguably been the podcast where i have just been my my mind has been happy i have been happy is 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 what i want to say <laughs> so, so thank you so much for doing this man uh, thank you for having me yeah man i i as soon as uh, the pandemic gets over and we can all move i would love to have you in person uh to to talk yeah. more about about these things mm-hmm. to jam jam further Mm-hmm. because i i really believe not to sound like some a newscaster reading off you know uh, specific salient features about what you do best but <laughs> I, i i really i really believe this i really believe that mm-hmm. that 
your ability to parse through disciplines and then combine them based on first principles and then and then not stop mm-hmm. at that that intellectual arrogance that might come with i know everything mm-hmm. but then trying to constantly figure it out to make it useful for mm-hmm. people and is is you know it's it's a bloody testament to what you can do when you when you just you know really put your mind to solving problems for the world and you know i i i wish you the best in these endeavors and thank you so much I really hope that you know we meet once this ends, so I can talk a bunch yes. and uh, you know eat your brain out about all of these things. Awesome! What Thank I'm, you so much. It was great being here. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's it, it's. I'm I'm also with this podcast. I'm also trying to mm-hmm. aggregate, aggregate as mm-hmm. much as I can with the, the mm-hmm. thinkers, the thought leaders in India, and and create like a visual archive and an audio archive, uh, so that people might might look at them mm-hmm. and and get some sort of uh, a roving masterclass in in. Um, in in mm-hmm. all of these fields without having to fully invest them in a 6 month course that doesn't that isn't you know in sync <laughs> with what the ground reality looks like so thank you zayan thank you so much uh, it was great being here it's great talking to you i hope we can continue the conversation maybe in a follow up maybe hopefully in person uh, i and yeah thanks for having me